Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cree Economic Institute. I'm Jack Pritchard. I'm the president. Um, I've been studying all week long uh, so I can learn how to spell economy and finance. Uh, I, I'm not quite there. Uh, so you're not going to hear from me today about any of these subjects. Uh, we're extremely pleased to be able to partner with the Korean Economic Society uh, to bring you the governor of the Bank of Korea uh, today. Uh, you may all know uh, that he's in, here in town for IMF meetings that are going to be taking place primarily uh, tomorrow. Um, so I, I'm not going to introduce him, but I'm going to uh, ask our co-partner, uh, Ms. Sue Vitas, uh, as I mentioned, uh, works at the IMF. Uh, she's been there for, I think, more than 30 years. Uh, she has... Uh, uh, um, she is the Senior Information Technology Team Leader at the IMF. In addition, uh, uh, I understand that she'd worked over 20 years as the Chief of Protocol for the IMF. So I'm hoping she's not taking notes in terms of how we did on lunch uh, or seating <laughs> arrangements, uh, but I know that she'll tell me afterwards. Uh, I'm not going to go into very much more detail because the, the whole point of today's program is to hear from the governor. So I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Vitas to come forward and introduce our main speaker today. Thanks very much. Thank you, President Pritchard, for your nice introduction. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank President Pritchard and his KEI staff and also uh, Bank of uh, Korea Washington uh, staff, also uh, for KES executive committee members for organizing this wonderful uh, opportunity for us to have a uh, Governor Kim at this uh, nice uh, KEI conference facility. We are all grateful to Governor Kim for being with us today, despite his busy schedule and also providing lunch. Thank you, Governor Kim. <laughs> Governor Chung Su Kim had a long and distinguished career serving both in public and in academia. He took office on April last year as the 24th Governor of the Bank of Korea and Chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee. Prior to his appointment as Governor of the Central Bank, he worked in Paris as the Korean Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the OECD. Before that, he served as a senior secretary to the president for economic affairs in the office of the president. Governor Kim has held many other posts as well, including president of Harlem University, president of the Korea Development Institute, dean of the Graduate School for International Studies, Gyeonghee University, and president of the Korea Institute of Public Finance. He also served as Assistant Minister and Special Advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Economy, and as Minister and Head of the OECD Office in the Korean Embassy in Paris, in charge of negotiation on Republic of Korea's accession to the OECD. In 1993, he was Secretary to the President for Economic Affairs in the Office of the President. Uh, his educational background is that he received a BA in economics from Seoul National University and a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania in 1979. His personal is that he's married and has one daughter. I'm just going to highlight his earlier career uh, so that people may uh, know what his progression was, his career progression was. He worked as a senior economist in the Korea Development Institute for 10 years, uh, where his research areas include macroeconomic policy management, manpower, and social welfare policy. Prior to that, he was a senior research associate of the Center for Human Resource Research at Ohio State University. He began his career as a research associate for Wharton Econometric Forecasting Associates Incorporated in 1975. So he had a very long and distinguished career since that time. His presentation today is on the subject of the current state of a global financial and its impact on Korea's economy. Please join me in welcoming Governor Kim. <laughs>
Good afternoon. I'd like to express my deep thanks to Ambassador Pritchett, President of KEI, for inviting me to speak. And Madam President of the KES, Korea Economic Society, uh, for introducing me so kindly. I'm very sorry that I had such a long list of uh, jobs during the past few years. Actually, I had 15 jobs since I came back uh, from the States to Korea in early 1980s. And having 15 jobs during the period of 20-some uh, years means that the average tenure of each job was less than two years. And, uh, and, in, and I moved around quite a lot among different uh, areas of services, including the government sector or academics or research area, even diplomats. And, um, but th now I serve as, as the governor of the Central Bank of Korea. And it seems to me that this is one of the more difficult jobs in that I have uh, more responsibilities. And uh, sometimes I'm a little hesitant of delivering a speech because in case I make any single mistake, that single mistake always turns out to be a very big mistake. <laughs> and, uh, but in the past, among the jobs which I had, um, I never worried that much of uh, delivering a speech. But since I became a governor, uh, as I said, I became aware of the importance of uh, saying worries and particularly uh, speaking something in foreign language. If I do it in Korean, I think I can do it a little much better. But uh, if I do it in English, which is not my mother tongue, I always uh, find myself in a very difficult situation because uh, I sometimes don't find adequate uh, words to express what I think. But today, I hope I can do things well. Therefore, uh, I don't find any, any headline news tomorrow morning. S and uh, several years ago, uh, one of my predecessors, the then uh, governor of the, of the Central Bank, uh, visited New York and he delivered a speech. And at that time, it was just uh, probably a slip of the tongue, but he said, uh, Korea, uh, the Central Bank of Korea planned to diversify its portfolio investments or something like that. And then the next morning, uh, the headline was that Korea decided to lower its, uh, its share of uh, dollar investments. And then the whole dollar value in Korea plunged and the whole stock market did not collapse but nearly collapsed. And, uh, and the staff of the central bank uh, had a so, sort of emergency meeting uh, how to, to find a way to deal with such a, such a problem. So since then on, uh, this, the governor was under heavy pressure from the staff not to speak when, when he, uh, he uh, goes abroad. But this time, I tried to be brave, and, uh, and so I came here. But, but I, it's, it's, it's indeed my great honor uh, to, uh, to meet you and to speak to you. And uh, I know that how busy uh, you are, but uh, if, if you come here, I think it's my responsibility to be uh, very honest to tell you what the situation of Korea is and how we view the global economy and so forth. So today I will do my best to, uh, to meet such a challenge. And my presentation will consist, I don't know how it, it works, should I put this one? Oh yes. Today, I will talk uh, on the global economy and then the impact of the changes in the global economy on, on the Korean economy. And uh, of course, I know that you are very much familiar with uh, what's going on in the global financial market. But I, I'd like to summarize rather briefly on such 
uh, trends to show you that uh, the views we have may not be much different from the views that you have. In the past, when I made a presentation about the Korean economy, I usually started by showing you what is happening in the Korean economy. But this time, I changed it so, so, so that I will begin by showing you how we view the global economy. I wouldn't spend much time on, on this issue, but uh, during the first part of my presentation, I will show you uh, the trends of uh, changes in the global economy. And then I will spend uh, most of my time in showing you uh, the impacts of such, uh, such changes on the, on the Korean economy. The causes, regarding the causes of the global financial crisis, I, I'm sure that you have your own views on the causes of the global financial crisis, but uh, it can be summarized as, as follows. One is the word, uh, the expression like uh, great moderation, because of that uh, there was, uh, they prevailed in, on over-optimism and uh, the risks were rather underestimated. Uh, sometimes due to what we call financial engineering, uh, risks were diversified and, uh, and, and it was, it was the risks were broken into smaller parts. Even though the risks were there, people were not aware of the, the risks. And uh, we learned from the 101 of the economic textbook that if there is a high return, there must, it must be associated with a high risk. But as those risks were broken into small price, people became unaware of the danger of risks. And that was probably one. And then, although we say that Lehman Krebs was the start of the current global crisis, but but before then, we knew that there was a supply mortgage crisis. And uh, we say that it depends. Some people say that supervision was a more, more of an important uh, policy that we have to uh, deal with. But uh, some people say that regulation itself was not adequate. And uh, so after the crisis uh, broke out, uh, we, by we, uh, the, the finance ministers or the central bank governors met in all different occasions. On all this evening, actually, there is a G20 meeting take place. Uh, there, uh, finance ministers and central bank go governors meet together to discuss uh, these matters. But in any event, uh, the, the financial regulation reform uh, efforts uh, characterized by Basel III effort were initiated right after the crisis. And then now the issues of supervision um, represented by the so-called macroprudential policies or to deal with the systemic risks have uh, become one of the major policy issues. In any event, so such is one of the, uh, one of the um, causes. And then global imbalances, I'm sure that you particularly you American people know of, the, of this uh, issue pretty well, the global imbalances in many respects. Of course, they were caused by the, by the flow of capital, but at the same time, in real sector, the imbalances uh, happen uh, among uh, different regions of the, of, of the world. And aftermath the, of the global crisis can be summarized as, as follows. As you can see from the graphs, a real GDP growth uh, plunged the, after the Lehman collapse. It bounced back a little bit, but not, by, not to the level of the pre-crisis yet. And uh, there was a deleveraging. And uh, I will uh, elaborate this issue uh, when I talk about the Korean uh, economic problem because in Korea, uh, household debt has emerged one of the more uh, critical issues because unlike other countries, unlike other, by, by that what I mean is that unlike all European and, and even USA, United States economy, uh, Korea overcame the crisis without uh, experiencing deleveraging. This uh, has uh, has has uh, dual effects in that it contributed 
uh, positively uh, overcoming the crisis, but at the same time, it creates another problem of, uh, of uh, solving the debt problem for Korea. So I will uh, touch upon that issue a little more in detail later. I will, I'd like to go over quickly because I have uh, nearly 40 pages of, uh, of, uh, of slides. And then uh, financial instability resurfaced. The expression QE2 is, is, uh, is very familiar here, and everybody these days knows the meaning of QE2. Uh, yesterday, the FOMC uh, announced a new program. I don't know whether you, call, you will call it QE3, but anyway, QE2 w was done, but, uh, but there are how can I say that? Some people say that QE2 uh, didn't take uh, much effect, but uh, I will. Uh, but I don't necessarily agree with that because because when you uh, you estimate or you analyze the impacts of certain policy, you always have to compare the effects with a state where such a policy was not was not introduced. So uh, even though your e economic recovery, by you, I mean U.S. economic recovery, uh, was uh, slower than expected, that doesn't necessarily mean that the policy was not effective. Had such a policy not, not introduced, probably you might have uh, experienced substantially lower economic growth. And, uh, but this is the expression that is used by, by the statement of the FOMC. Uh, OFMC always used the term, the pace of economic recovery uh, was slower than expected. And uh, I challenged this very many times to the people of the Fed and, and also other uh, international organizations. My question was, they ever challenged or checked whether the expectations were right? And uh, if they had uh, such uh, high expectations for economic recovery, then you may be disappointed for what you have achieved. But it seems to me that if your crisis, or the crisis that, that you have is, is indeed the severest since the Great Depression, then how come you expect you recover from such a crisis within such a short period of time? It's just a couple of years have passed, and uh, you are very much uh, impatient that you haven't reached the level of pre-crisis. And I said, it used to take, what, six to seven years in the past. Uh, of course, if you shorten the sample period so that if you compare the current crisis with those uh, post-World War II, then you may say that the recovery has been a little slower than expected. But you s began saying that you were experiencing the severest crisis since the Great Depression, right after the Lehman collapse, then if that is the case, I always uh, thought that it would take a little long for you to have the economy back to your pre-crisis level. In any event, it was more of an academic uh, discussion, but uh, the, the expression that, that the FOMC has used uh, so far was that your recovery was uh, weaker than expected. In any event, that was uh, the, the result of such a, such a uh, policy. And then another uh, phenomenon is that the risk, the risk of crisis contagion uh, moved from very periphery to, uh, to, the, to the core countries you will see uh, this, uh, this phenomenon later. I will show it by showing some, some graphs and, and, and tables. And then uh, capital flows move from emerging economies to, uh, to advanced economies. And uh, this is what we call uh, the, the, new, the new expressions that uh, the United States began using uh, rather recently was that uh, there is a two-way spillover. There are two-way spillover effects rather than one-way spillover. And in the past, by that, uh, before the current crisis, we always talk about the one-way spillover, just a unidirectional effect from the so-called uh, 
advanced economies to emerging economies. But now uh, we began uh, not worrying but concerning about the two-way spillover effects. And uh, th this turned out to be one of the uh, new uh, phenomena which we are facing after the crisis. And then uh, the whole crisis be became a full circle from financial to, to real to sovereign debt and, and again financial crisis like that. And uh, you, you can see from this uh, graph that, that uh, the, the economic growth rates of both uh, United States and, and Germany, which uh, have grown higher than, uh, than those of other European countries, have uh, slowed down rather substantially uh, in recent months. And then um, Euro area banks have faced uh, funding difficulties. And by seeing this uh, plunge in the, in the stock market, and then uh, this one shows that, as you know already, that uh, the, um, the U.S. Uh, MMF, money, money, money funds, uh, MMF's exposure to euro banks have uh, declined rather substantially. The total amount of decline turned out to be what more than 11 uh, percent or in June. And the uh, stock market have plunged, you can see from here. And at the, at the, at the same time, uh, the uh, stock prices of European markets also declined substantially. And the uh, U.S. weaker than expected economic recovery can be seen uh, from these from this, uh, uh, tables that uh, it, the, the revised uh, growth rate turned out to be substantially lower than uh, originally expected. And then unemployment rate remained high and, uh, and house prices have not uh, risen. And, and for the case of uh, rising or, or remaining at a high level of unemployment of the states can be interpreted in many different ways. Uh, in your case, in, uh, of course, uh, very high policy prior priority is, is uh, put to high unemployment rate. But, some, but, but, but sometimes I regard that the efforts of your economy to uh, restructure. If, uh, if economic restructuring has not taken place, probably the job sharings and other, other types of efforts can be made, like the case of uh, many European countries and so forth. But for the case of uh, United States, it seems to me that you have a very high confidence in the, uh, in the resilience or in the flexibility of, of the labor market. So uh, for the case of Korea, for example, we, we currently have 3.3 unemployment rate, and uh, people appraise uh, that uh, Korea has succeeded in maintaining a low unemployment rate. Yes, of course, it, to a certain extent, the answer is yes. But right after the crisis broke out in late 2008, one of the campaigns we had was to ask the big companies to hold the labor rather than lay off or rather than fire the labor. So sort of a job sharing has prevailed for some time. And, uh, but in your case, but for the case of the United States, the United States didn't introduce such, uh, such an effort. And so currently, uh, of course, there could be some ways to reduce the unemployment rate, but you didn't uh, move in such a direction. But I think uh, the, uh, it's a little premature to, to assess uh, whether or not the policies that you have taken were right, but I, I see some merit of, of maintaining it in case you can, uh, you can uh, continue to do so. And, and then if your economy revives, then I think uh, the whole uh, labor market uh, can, became, can become healthier. 
Uh, for the case of other countries, inclu including European economies and others, when uh, job sharing and other programs are introduced, uh, for some time or temporarily, the unemployment rate can uh, can be maintained lower, but uh, that may prolong the economic restructuring efforts. Uh, th this you can um, you can see such a case for the case of uh, Japan in the past and so forth. So in, in any event, there can be several different ways of uh, interpreting that. Oh, it seems to me that time is running fast. I, I, I don't know whether you're watching in Washington runs the same speed as that in Korea, but it seems to me that time runs very quickly here. So I will speed up a little bit. For and the uh, government debt problem, I will just you can see that uh, for the case of the United States, you will have uh, some uh, difficulties in, in solving this one. And then uh, for the case of Europe, uh, tw twin crisis. Twin crises include uh, fiscal uh, crisis and banking crisis. And uh, without further uh, explaining uh, these graphs, I will say that these uh, twin programs are likely to uh, happen for the case of uh, for Europe. And uh, from this table, you can see uh, the, how much uh, the, the exposes of the European banks of uh, Greek uh, sovereign uh, debts. And for the case of France, the ratio becomes 25% uh, of the GDP. And, uh, and also uh, for the case of Germany, 15%. And for the UK, for the total of Europe, it turns out to be 13%. Uh, so the, the health of the, of the bank is a question. And uh, the major risks of the global financial system can be characterized by the, by the four words. Uh, one is deleveraging, the second is political leadership, the third is policy space, and the fourth is uh, limited scope of the emerging market economies. I will very quickly go over all this. There are, for the case of deleveraging, uh, Originally, it started from the private sector, but uh, the public sector deleveraging is likely to uh, to happen, and uh, always there is a conflict between uh, long-term financial stability and short-term growth recovery. And uh, this paradox of thrift and debt overhang, and these two have been very popular these days. Uh, we learn from the uh, textbook of economics that there is a paradox of thrift. If uh, saving savings is good uh, for an individual, but if all people begin saving, then the, the whole economy will face a shortage of demand, that type of thing. And that, that overhang means that in case uh, there is a public debt, there is a crowding out effect of the private investment and and because of the high public debt if interest rates rise then ex then uh, returns to long term investment are likely to be lower so all the, these are the the problems and uh, to that extent uh, this uh, deleveraging because of this one the economy uh, has uh, to face a d dilemma and then political Leadership problem, I will not mention this because you know this more than I do. And, uh, and then uh, limited policy space in advanced economies as, uh, for both monetary policy and, and fiscal policy. Uh, policy rates of the advanced economies uh, all, uh, became were reduced and, and uh, they remain at, at very low level. And uh, for the case of the United States, Japan, you know, they all uh, have uh, so-called uh, zero lower bound uh, problems. And uh, then they have a fiscal policy problem. And uh, so th there are uh, not much policy spaces. And then for the case of emerging economies, of course, emerging economies have to do something to help uh, the whole world 
recover from the crisis or the whole world uh, maintain uh, stability, but uh, they are a little afraid of doing so because uh, first uh, they have a fear of their currency to be appreciated and because many developing countries uh, grow based upon exports and, uh, and because of that, because of such, such a fear and the policy cooperation between advanced and emerging economies are likely to be limited. And uh, so there is a limited scope of emerging economies as recovery engine. The, the, now let's go to, uh, to Korean economy also quickly. This table summarizes the current state of Korean economy. You can see that uh, Korean economy has recovered from the crisis rather quickly. In 2009, uh, among the 30 OECD countries, there were only three which recorded a uh, positive growth rate. Uh, Korea, Poland, and, and uh, Australia were the three. And then all other countries experienced negative growth. And in 2010, Korea grew by 6.2%. And so uh, to a certain extent, we were able to say that we overcame uh, the global crisis. And this year, recently, the IMF lowered its uh, prediction or forecast of Korean economic growth from 4.5 to 4.0. But we at the bank, with the bank, uh, currently maintains the uh, forecast of uh, this year's growth uh, of 4.3%. Uh, of course, there can be a slow adjustment, but in any event, 4% growth rate is not bad in, in that our potential growth rate is estimated to be around uh, 4%. So if we, grow by f if we grow by 4%, I think we are doing fine. And, uh, and th th the, the most difficult uh, policy issue that we are currently facing is uh, rising inflation. Uh, I, I, as a central bank governor, I'm not in a position to defend myself for not meeting the, uh, by the way, Korea is one of the countries which is doing inflation targeting. And uh, our inflation targeting uh, is that we target uh, of 3% the, of, of CPI and with a buffer of uh, plus minus one, one percentage point. So our inflation as measured by CPI uh, is targeted to be 2 to 4 percent. But this year, it is likely that we may not meet such a such target. In, in the okay, uh, due to time constraint, I will not go in detail, but uh, that is one of the more critical questions that we are currently facing. Inflation, unemployment rate is, is 3.5 percent, so it's, it's okay with us. And we have recorded current account surpluses uh, for the past uh, three years. Even 2008, we recorded current account surpluses, and then uh, this amounted to nearly 4 percent of GDP, and this amounts to uh, a little less than 2 percent, around um, this is the estimate of up to uh, of August, and I expect that we would have a little less than uh, 20 um, uh, billion dollars of uh, current account sur surplus, which is a little less than 2% of GDP. And the impacts can be uh, analyzed in two different ways. One is real channel impact, the other is final ch financial channel impact. Uh, Korea is very heavily depending upon external demand, and uh, but they are rather diversified. By by that, uh, the share of exports, uh, Korean uh, exports, is is as follows. China is currently number one trading partner, but uh, the ratio is about twenty five percent. So one of one half one quarter of Korean ex exports goes to, goes to China. U.S. used to be number one for a long, long period of time, but uh, U.S. Euro, Euro area becomes number two. And the 20 percent, no, no, this is Southeast Asia, 20 percent. In, in EU and, and uh, UA, USA both uh, constitute about, what, 11 to 20, 12 percent of, uh, of our exports. So we are rather, uh, rather diversified. But 30% uh, of our exports actually go to advanced economies, US, uh, EU, and, and Japan. 
And um, so to that extent, we are affected by global economy. And, and another rather complex, complicated issue is that although China is our number one trading partner, what we export does not, the, the final destination of our export to China is not China. What that means is that nearly half of them are exported to the third country as a joint product between Korea and, and China. So this complicates the whole analysis. Some people say that in case Chinese yuan is appreciated, whether uh, Korea's uh, export to China will, will increase. And uh, if, if it's only two country model, of course, that, is, that must be the case. But as I said, half of them are exporting to the third country. As, uh, so so for the, that means that uh, nearly half of, of our exports to China are uh, intermediate or, or parts. And uh, so uh, we were indirectly affected by global economy through the impact of our export to China. So this, uh, this diagram shows how the direct and indirect effects are, are, are related. And for the, we have a model, a BOK global model, and uh, by that model we learn that in case US uh, GDP growth is reduced by declines by one percentage point, uh, Korea's GDP will grow by 0.44 percentage point. So we are very much affected by, uh, by U.S. economy and inflation is affected by that and so forth. And uh, this is the one which uh, the IMF uh, recently uh, published. And uh, as I already mentioned that, I will skip that. And then uh, the, on the final channel, I will just explain this by showing the diagram. Our COSPI uh, uh, stock price index declined by 15% during last month. This was second after the uh, Germany. Germany was affected s substantially, but uh, after U.S. Uh, downgrade of rating, Germany was German. German's stock market was affected, and the prices declined by 19% but uh, Korea also was affected very much. And, uh, but the, for the case of bond market, okay, let me, let me uh, explain this by using half a minute. This is a very important uh, distinction uh, between the current state and the economic state of Korea in 2008. Uh, we are very much vulnerable, vulnerable to external shocks. As you know, our Korean uh, capital market is nearly completed. I dare say that among the all emerging economies, no economy is more open than Korea to foreign competition. And, uh, and the capital markets are nearly perfectly, completely open. So that is why our volatilities in, in, in capital markets, including foreign exchange market, are so high. During the year of 2010, uh, if you compute uh, per day fluctuation of foreign exchange, uh, Korean won uh, fluctuated by 0.6% per day during the whole year of 2010. And uh, there are about 25 currencies uh, whose data are available to us. Euro is just one, so uh, the 25 includes almost all currencies of, of the countries. And uh, Korea was ranked number four in terms of the daily fluctuation of foreign exchange during uh, the year of 2010. After South Africa and Russia and Brazil like that. Uh, the Korean won fluctuated even more than Euro which is the currency of the epicenter of the crisis. And uh, this is one of the very important policy issues to us. Why Korean won should have fluctuated more than Euro during, and th that was the case. And, and, but this year, Korean won has been a little more stabilized. So if we estimate, we do the same analysis for the year of uh, the 2011 uh, from January to, to to, uh, to probably July, not to August, because some of the data are not available. We are r ranked about 10th. 10th. Then, that means that Korean won has been 
stabilized more this year than, than the year, uh, year of 2010. But just during the past couple of days, the story changing, and uh, we are very much affected by, uh, by the, um, the certain uh, changes in, in Europe and others. And you may wonder why. The reason is that uh, the ratio of European capital is nearly 50%. What that means is that uh, capital that came to Korea 50% are from Europe. And so we are very much affected by European states. So if, if capital flew out because of the Korean economic conditions, of course, we have to worry much. But this time, that is not the case. Capital flew out from Korea, particularly Europeans. Uh, but that the, the main reason was not that Koreans' economic prospects are bad, but simply because those European banks uh, need funding. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because, unlike the case of 2008, right after Lehman uh, collapse, uh, capital flew out from both, uh, both stock market and bond market. But this time, capital are currently flowing in in Korean bond market. And of course, Europeans withdrew their, their capital from, uh, from Korean bond market, but not by substantially, but but slightly, but in any way, th th there was a capital uh, flow out, outflow. But uh, for the case of um, other Asian central banks or other Asians or s other emerging economies, they began investing in the Korean bond market. So overall, we somehow uh, maintain not a balance, but, but not much of a serious capital outflow uh, these days. So that is one of the major distinctions uh, between the current state and the state of current economy of 2008. That was what this diagram show. But due to time constraint, I will just skip most of these. And uh, some of you may wonder whether uh, rollover or borrowings of, uh, of Korean banks uh, and uh, and currently, uh, we don't see much of uh, difficulties in that the 100% the of the rollover have been done. But the spread has been a little higher these days. And it's quite natural. Uh, the whole CDS premium has increased. And so the spread has, has increased slightly, uh, but uh, rollover rate turned out to be 100 percent. And, uh, and contingent risk, some of you may wonder. Yes, uh, of course, there are some contingent risks. Uh, but in terms of our financial assets, we didn't invest much in, in, in European uh, markets. But uh, we have some substantial liabilities from European. As I said, uh, 50 percent of the capital uh, to Korea came from Europe. So to that extent, we have certain liabilities. But we don't have much investment, so our risks from investment size are not high, but from liability size are, are some high. And then what are the silver lining for Korean uh, financial system? I will also explain this by using others. But here, one of the statistics some of you may, uh, may like to know, uh, unlike the case of 2008, uh, the short-term uh, debt out of total debt uh, has reduced. Uh, it, it was 52% three years ago, but now it was reduced to 30%. And the amount of foreign reserves relative to short-term debt turned out to be over 200%. Uh, we have uh, currently uh, a little over $300 billion of foreign reserves. And uh, that is more than twice. Uh, of our short-term debt. Then what are the future challenges? There are basically two. One is a soft landing of household debt problem. The other is a financial stability uh, problem, issue, not the problem. But uh, first, this is currently one of the more uh, important policy issues that we are currently facing. And, uh, and the soft landing of household debt problem is one of the more critical issues. And w our 
ratio of household debt relative to disposable income amounts to 132 percent, which is a little higher than that of yours, and uh, probably ranked second in the world after UK. And but there are two things. One is that this quintile distribution shows that most of the deaths are owed by high income people rather than low income people. That was one. And the second one is that, it's not elaborated here, but the second one is that, uh, unlike the case of Japan of the late 1980s and early 90s and other countries, our financial institutions are healthy in that we have imposed very strict LTV regulation, loan to value regu regulation. LTV for, the, for Korea currently is about 47.2% which is substantially lower than the LTV that you had uh, during the time of a subprime mortgage or, or for other countries. And so because of such a low LTV, uh, our financial institutions uh, uh, don't, I don't expect financial institutions uh, will face uh, any uh, substantial difficulties because of this ha household problem. But just like the case of other uh, debt problems, there is always a conflict between a smoothing process and uh, maintaining debt one. You know, from the long-term perspective, you have to sometimes you have to find somehow to to uh, to deal with such a debt problem. But in in the short term, this is mainly basically a, a smoothing question. For the case of a government debt, it's a it's a matter of uh, revenue smoothing, and uh, so if you cut the, uh, if you want to reduce the debt too quickly, that means that in, in the short term, your economy is likely to be affected much so that the economy may not grow. So such a, the same problem, we are facing the same problem. And financial stability issue, and um, just like other countries, of course, we are prepared, or we should prepare for the conditions to meet the uh, Basel III. Uh, but uh, basically speaking, uh, we uh, Korean banks don't face any whatsoever difficulties in meeting the capital requirements, unlike those of Europeans and others. Why? As we experienced very severe financial crisis in late 1990s, uh, and and, uh, and so uh, Korean uh, banks actually uh, recapitalized, and so our capital uh, state. Is, uh, is, is, is very high. And uh, so we don't see any difficulties in meeting capital requirements, but we are likely to meet some difficulties in liquidity, uh, liquidity requirements. Uh, liquidity coverage ratio, or NSFR, which stands for uh, the stable funding ratios, I, these are all related to liquidities. For the case of LCR, as, as many of you know, that's the ratio of uh, of uh, liquid assets relative to what 30 day net cash outflow. So how much of liquid assets you have as compared to the, the necessity of uh, net cash that the banks need for the 30 days activities, that type of stuff. That should be 100%, but uh, our uh, statistics currently show a little lower than 100%. And the stable funding ratio also means it's more of the long-term one for a year or for one year. Uh, there, if there is a required uh, stable funding, and if you're available, what is the ratio of your available uh, stable funding? And so both have to be met, uh, have to be over 100 percent. We are a little short of that, but one is uh, we have to meet by the by the year of uh, 2015. The other by 2017. So we are making efforts to meet these two, uh, two requirements. But except for these two, uh, we don't see any problem of meeting Basel three requirements. These are the uh, capital, I don't call those capital control, but uh, at the OECD code, uh, some of you may be familiar with this. O the OECD has capital uh, to liberalization of, of, of capital. One is about capital movement. The other is on invisible transactions. And, and there are certain codes. And, but at the OECD, there is no distinction between uh, capital control and macroprudential uh, regulation. Macroprudential is this relatively new concept. 
And so I, I, actually I sent my staff together with those of uh, finance ministry to the IMF and to the OECD for consultations. And that the reason is that we are introducing a new macro prudential policy, which I hope other emerging markets uh, follow the, the program that we propose. That is uh, the, here is described as macro prudential stability levy. This is conceptually this is similar to banking bank tax that several European uh, countries uh, introduce, but uh, the difference is that this is, is not a tax. For the case of tax, the, the, you know, it's the, the government uh, that collects, but this is the levy so that uh, banks uh, contribute to the to the fund, and and then the fund can be used in case they face any uh, financial stabilities. And this is different from capital control in that there is no discrimination against uh, non-residents. So residents and non-residents are treated equally. So national treatment is is applied there, and so forth. So and and furthermore, currently levy is imposed on on foreign currency. Uh, non-core liabilities, but uh, in case we find it needed, we, we can impose it to domestic currency non-deposit uh, liabilities too. And recently, the act of the Bank of Korea was amended. Uh, unlike uh, most other countries, uh, Korea, like uh, Japan and just one or two other countries, had a single mandate. The single mandate was to maintain uh, price stability. But this time, the act was amended so that uh, the bank uh, was given uh, not a single mandate, but one more mandate of maintaining. Not maintaining the whole uh, financial stability, but we were in, in the new act, it was stipulated that in doing, in carrying out the monetary policy, financial stability has to uh, be considered, or due consideration should be, should be put there. And, uh, and these are the key uh, changes to the Bank of Korea Act, but uh, due to time constraint, I'll skip uh, the detailed explanation, explanations about this. And uh, I spent a little more than I, I hoped to, but as I said, had I done it in Korean, I could have done much uh, faster. But <laughs> It's uh, because of uh, linguistic uh, difficulty. It took a little long that I expected, but so just as I said in the beginning, you may uh, challenge my expectation. My expectation always, what I have, rather than saying that what, ha what I have done wrong, but I say that my expectation was wrong. And, and uh, well, in any event, I'll stop there, and uh, I'll be more than happy to entertain some comments and questions from you. Oh, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That was a, a terrific. Uh, uh, presentation. I, I, I'm embarrassed when he says that his expectation because of linguistic problems, I, I don't know what they were. <laughs> uh, what, a, what a terrific presentation in English. Um, I hope that in my Q&A that I can, my English is up to yours. Because, uh, but, you know, I, I was looking forward to this uh, for a lot of reasons, and, and you've just seen why for the main one. The other was, you know, there have been two institutions that were founded uh, at the same time. The Bank of Korea, and I think you're waiting for me to say the Korea Economic Institute. Um, that's not true. KEI is 30 <laughs> years old. Uh, the Bank of Korea was established in 1950, and so was I. So uh, <laughs> I have an affinity with the Bank of Korea. It was a very good year. Uh, we're gonna, we've got some time for some, some questions today. You've been very generous in, uh, in having your lunch and, and then uh, uh, very politely uh, listening to a terrific presentation. So we're going to uh, allow you to, uh, to ask the governor some questions. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, 
uh, Bertrand Renaud, if you would uh, ask the first question. Uh, please wait until the microphone comes uh, and then uh, identify yourself uh, so the governor knows uh, uh, what your bias is in your question. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Governor. This was a very uh, informative presentation that brings us up to date. And uh, the general reaction I have is that Korea is well prepared uh, domestically for its uh, challenges. So you were suggesting that the biggest challenges would come from outside. And uh, how uh, are you, uh, what are the kind of strategies that Korea is choosing? You have diversified your trade, your financial system is much better diversified than after 2008. Are you working towards uh, regional arrangements or purely national arrangements to uh, manage external shocks that are coming or are uh, concerning all of us? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, President. Actually, President and I worked together, what, nearly 30 years ago. At that time, uh, we were doing some consulting business for the World Bank, and uh, from KDI, I, 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 had an, I had an honor of working with him. And I learned a lot for, from that time and on, and we have made, uh, made since then on. Well, good question. And um, I don't think we can uh, find ways to deal with such, a, such, a, uh, such an impact from outside uh, nationally. And at, at the G20 meeting last year, Korea as a chair and as a Korea initiative, Korea proposed of establishing a global financial safety net. And uh, this is a way to, to deal with the impacts of the changes in capital flows on domestic economy, and particularly for, for some countries, which we call uh, by innocent bystanders. And they, they were just penalized by, by global crisis. In that case, unless they are protected from such crisis, and they are likely to find their own ways to, to uh, protect, then global imbalances are likely to maintain. That was our, our, our argument. And, uh, but to be very honest with you, when the crisis broke out in, in late nine, in, two, in 2008, all countries were fully aware of the risks of not cooperating. But since then on, uh, the emerging economies have, generally speaking, overcome the crisis, whereas uh, advanced economies have not. And so crisis resolution is still a matter of a, a concern or a political issue or important issue for advanced economies. But for the case of emerging economies, a crisis, crisis resolution is not an issue at all. You don't see any Chinese who says that Chinese, China is facing crisis. Or you don't see many Koreans who say Korea is facing crisis. We, we are just trying to, to, uh, to deal with the problems that come from outside. And so the whole world is divided into two parts. And so it's very difficult to, to unite the, the two sides. And uh, we all know that uh, policy coordination is essential to, uh, to resolve the problem. So to answer your question, yes, it is important. And uh, we all acknowledge the importance of policy coordination among the countries now what we uh, hope is to have a very strong global political leadership, not a national political leadership. We all know that we live in a global economy, but we know that there is no global jurisdiction. And uh, therefore, uh, any problem can happen anytime. There is no global jurisdiction. So we hope that G20, for example, as an uh, economic fora, uh, premier fora, can play such a role. Governor, thank you for an excellent presentation. 
Would you discuss China, please? You mentioned the EU and the U.S. as uh, the key in uh, your economic planning, but I would assume that China is even more important. Uh, what are the prospects, do you see, uh, of investment from China? It's just booming with so much foreign exchange reserve around the world. Are you seeing increased investment by China into Korea? And how do you see the market there? And how are you relating to its growth? Of course, China uh, has invested in Korea. And, uh, and uh, it is likely that the investment from China uh, is increasing. And, and, uh, and furthermore, like other countries, China has maintained rather stable economic growth, but stable but high. This year, uh, China is expected to grow by over 9%. And during the first quarter, they grew by 97 During the second quarter, 9.5%. And on average, above 9%. So it, it grew high. And uh, some, some people uh, say that China may face some problems of, uh, let's say, banking sector. Uh, problem or the government sector, but I don't see uh, they will face serious problems. So they will continue to grow for some time, and uh, that it is that is one. And then, uh, as I as you mentioned, China invests in not only in Korea but in in other Asian regions, and that will help. That will help for both. And uh, so, to answer your question, yes, I would say so. Uh, thank you, Governor. Mike Billington. I work with the Executive Intelligence Review and Lyndon LaRouche. Um, as, as you may know, there's a growing uh, support for, in the United States Congress, for re restoring the Glass-Steagall Act, going back to the Roosevelt policy of separating the speculative investment banks from commercial banks and only guaranteeing the commercial banks. Uh, this is now also being very seriously discussed in Europe, in England, and in Switzerland because of the UBS problem and, and so forth, uh, and has national support here from trade unions and farms and others. So as I understand it, you have in Korea a policy similar to Glass-Steagall in place, uh, but as it's becoming an international issue, and as you say, we need global leadership, I wonder if you could comment on uh, your nation's policy and your support for this international uh, way of dealing with this global financial breakdown crisis? Well, I should have made it a little earlier that I always like to take an easy question rather than a, such a difficult question. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether I can answer it in simple words. Of course, in principle, I would say yes. I, I, I would, yes, and, and uh, uh, we all know that the crisis, we all know as, as I began my presentation uh, by showing you the causes of the current crisis, and we all know where the crisis broke out and who were, which sector uh, was responsible for a crisis. And that is why in, in the States uh, you try to introduce Dodd-Frank Act and in general and, uh, and, and all other uh, financial regulation reforms which are characterized by Basel III. That I the Basel III actually includes most. And there the key word is systemic risk. And uh, what that means is that up until Basel, Basel II, uh, the health or soundness of financial institutions was, uh, was a key concern, but uh, in Basel III, uh, what we learned was that, just like the case of fallacy of composition, if every in institution is, is, uh, is, is functioning properly, if we add up, sometimes you end up with certain problems. That is characterized by the expression systemic risk. And so in order to deal with systemic risk, Basel III was, was, uh, was, uh, was devised. And uh, there, of course, the key is what to do this. And furthermore, it's not a matter of, uh, of uh, investment bank and others. Uh, and Basel, in Basel III, it started with dealing, it started dealing with uh, banking sector. But now, 
we learned that we have to extend our coverage to include non-banking sector. So shadow banking sector uh, should be included in, in the whole discussions. So it's not just a matter of a Glass-Steagall Act, but it's, it, it, the coverage is, must be much, much broader. But uh, for the case of emerging markets like Korea and others, these, th these shadow banking sector itself is not very large. But for the case of the United States, of course, relatively speaking, much larger than those of other countries. And so it has a little more uh, implication. But mm, I would say that uh, as, uh, as further progress is made on financial regulation issue, the coverage should be, should be further expanded. Dr. Chung. My name is Chol Chung, uh, Korea International Trade Association. Thank you very much for your uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, I hope the, uh, the, my question does not put you on the uh, headlines tomorrow morning. Um, actually, I agree with you on the, uh, the uh, Korean exchange market is very uh, uh, vulnerable to the uh, external market. And it's not new. And we all know that the, uh, the Korean, uh, Korean government and the, uh, the Bank of Korea have been trying to keep the, uh, the Korean exchange market uh, to be less volatile and the other more healthy. And um, you also mentioned that yeah, the, the reason why the, the Korean uh, exchange, mar exchange rate actually uh, fluctuates a lot is not because of the, the Korean economy uh, you know, fundamentals, but the, the, this volatility actually will affect the, the Korean uh, real economy as well. Yeah, you know. So um, my question is that as we have just witnessed the, the, the recent uh, you know, uh, fluctuation of the exchange rates in Korea, do you think the, the current uh, policies will bring the, the Korean exchange market to the stability? Or if there's anything that uh, more fundamental and more structural policy uh, changes should be made? And I'd like to hear your uh, comment. Well, as I said in the beginning, there are certain issues that the central bank governor is not supposed to comment on. They include basically three variables. One is interest rate, the second is foreign reserves, the third is exchange rate. Because once the central bank governor comments on that, the whole markets will be affected. So, uh, but having said so, how can I say that I wouldn't comment at all on such an important issue? We all know that the foreign exchange rate has to change uh, responding to markets. And uh, fundamentally speaking, uh, the exchange rate has to be uh, determined at the market. And uh, we uh, maintain such a principle. And of course, there may be some who may suspect that we may not uh, abide by such a rule, but that is not necessarily the case. These days, everything is very much transparent, and uh, we stick by that rule. Of course, all central banks are doing certain so type of uh, so-called uh, smoothing operation, and it's just a matter of uh, degrees, but uh, Korea is... is, is um, as I said, uh, all Korea always respects the principle that exchange rate should be uh, fundamentally determined uh, by the market forces. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry. Two, so let me add one. So that is why I, I discussed the volatilities in the foreign exchange rather than the level of the foreign exchange. Thank you. I'm Charles Kimball with the Korea Center for International Finance in New York. Um, it's sometimes said that Korea, having gone from being a developing country to a relatively advanced country, and having gone through the Asian crisis, is a good example for emerging countries to learn from. Now, most of your discussion was about the problems that are in advanced countries, and I'm wondering, could we extend that example of Korea to you being a good example for advanced countries to learn from? And if so, what policy recommendation, recommendations might you give 
given the choice that countries face between perhaps taking the medicine, as Korea did, and having a very sharp downward V, but then a sharp correction back, versus Japan going a long time without taking much medicine. What might that medicine be that you would recommend that countries should consider taking? In just a minute, uh, Dr. Yeah. Campbell came from New York just for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you had an opportunity to ask the question. That means that I should answer to him, <laughs> right? <laughs> Very good question. We have spent, as an economist, as a, as a, as a where uh, now I serve as a governor, but I have spent most of my time uh, as as an as a applied econometrician or as an economist or policy analyst. We have spent much time analyzing the Japanese experiences. First of all. And uh, because we, we wanted to learn some lessons from, from uh, their, uh, their experience. And uh, of, of course, we try to learn uh, experiences from small European countries, too. United States is too big a country for us to learn. And uh, US, United States is such a unique country. If you live in the States, you don't know what your country is. But uh, if you li live outside the United States, you know that USA is not it's not a country to refer to. It's a, such a big, it's just a word. And uh, uh, it seems to me that market principle can be, can function probably only in the United States. If not the only, probably one of the few areas. The reason is that to have a market economy, you need to have numerous suppliers and numerous demanders all the time. And uh, for other economies, such a condition cannot be met. So the so-called free market economy uh, cannot function properly in other regions. There are always certain types of restrictions or regulations imposed. And uh, Japan is not, a, is, not, is not an exception. And all European countries are not exception. They, they, they all face such, such problems, of course. The, the same was true for Korea. We always wanted to establish a market uh, principle all the time, but uh, there are certain certain restrictions to do so. Constraints, we have faced a lot of constraints. And uh, the way it, to answer your question, uh, what others can learn from current experience in, in overcoming the crisis? When Korea faced the crisis, I'm sorry that we have such high, high, uh, government, high officials from the IMF, so I have to be very, 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 very <laughs> careful and cautious in the same time because uh, some of you who know Korea, in Korea, we always like to blame others rather than blame ourselves. So we never say that we experienced Korean economic crisis. We say we experienced the IMF crisis. And I'm really sorry to say this, but uh, if you take a look at the report done by the, the other international organizations, uh, there have been more than 200 e small and, and, and large uh, financial, economic, banking crisis during the few uh, decades, but nobody blamed others. But we say that we never experienced a crisis. There is no such Korean crisis. We always say IMF crisis. And then the, when the crisis came, what, uh, it, it was one of the merits of Korea that we learned uh, from our history that uh, united we stand, divided we fall. This is the catchphrase uh, from the first president of Korea, the era of the first president of Korea. We have been a colony of Japan for some time, and so since then on, usually the countries are divided when, when the countries face difficulties or crisis. And so we, we, we know that uh, if united we stand, if divided we fall. And so when crisis broke out, people say, it was a matter of economic policies. But that may not be the case. It's more of a political issue. And so strong leadership, I, I mentioned strong leadership, political leadership as one of the four uh, issues to be dealt with. So political leadership is, is, is key. And uh, Korea had, and it, for both cases in the late 1990s and for the case 2008, uh, Korea had a political leadership. 
and, and the whole nation was united. And uh, we know that we were not, uh, we were very much vulnerable to external shocks, and we were not naturally in doubt. So unless we are united, there may not be a way for us to overcome the crisis. And so we, nobody knows what the optimal policy was or what the right policy was, but once the policy was decided, then we all followed the suit. But for the case of other countries, that, uh, it appears to me that doesn't, that, is not, that doesn't have to be the case. Always the, the opinions are divided, not united, and the leadership was not that strong. And uh, that was, I think, one of the key. And the second one is that it's not only the political leadership, but the leadership of, of many areas of, of, of the economy. And um, for example, in Korea, we have a very, we had, uh, had or still have very strong uh, labor union. But when a crisis breaks out, uh, even uh, th those militant or strong labor union cooperate with others, in, in, at least in overcoming the crisis. And, uh, what, and you may wonder where such, uh, such a force come from. That's a, I cannot answer it quickly, but, but we are more or less, we people have more or less certain understanding that unless we do, we may not succeed in achieving what we hope to achieve. And uh, so the crisis itself, uh, some people may call it an economic phenomenon, but it cannot be solved by economic policies alone. Sometimes you need more than economic policies. Well, uh, we're going to have one last question, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Shen, uh, and then uh, we, we, we're going on. But this is a, a, a terrific presentation, good questions. Uh, but we're going to have to let Governor Kim move on to his next appointment very shortly. So, Richard, you get to close out the session. Thank you. Um, thank you, Governor, for an excellent presentation. And um, my question is going, goes back to what you said maybe last year or year before during our luncheon where you said um, that the, the, the double dip will not occur. And now, looking at your presentation, we see declining uh, um, growth and growth rate and also stagnation. And I'm wondering whether you're going to uh, have a reassessment of that statement, uh, whether we would be faced with a, with a possible double dip, and what's Korea's response to that. And then secondly, in terms of the um, foreign exchange volatility, uh, I think that part of the volatility also comes from the fast-moving capital uh, in Korea. That is, that the Korean capital market has now, financial market has now open, um, is very open, and, and therefore the market forces, uh, you know, force these uh, monies to move around in such a way that it's not that the real economy that's affecting the, finan uh, the foreign exchange as much as the financial markets is affecting the uh, foreign exchange. And I didn't know whether you had any comments on that point. Thank you, Richard. Well, you, you must know better than I do about the US economy. And uh, saying something as a foreigner uh, on the US economy, uh, makes me feel a little more uncomfortable. But uh, as you ask me, uh, I would like to answer in the following way. I don't know how you define a recession or a double deep recession, but uh, if we just adopt the convention, conventional uh, definition of recession in that economy grows negatively uh, as compared to the previous quarter on two, two consecutive quarters, I would say the likelihood is very, very low. Uh, you experienced, by your US economy, uh, experienced uh, what, minus 0.3% growth in 2008, and uh, a little over 3% in 2009, no, 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 minus 3.2009 and the 3% uh, in 2010. So overall, you didn't, uh, you didn't grow at all for the past two years, minus, minus 0.3, minus 3.5, and 3%. So overall, you, you haven't grown at all. 
and then this year you grew by well, 0 0.4 and then this is just as compared to the previous quarter and then 1.4. So the, what that means is that this, or, or to put it differently, uh, the, many forecast that you will grow by 1.7% this year. So this is the first time that you actually grow. During the past three years, it's just a matter of uh, technical rebounding. In, in, in zero point, minus 0 0.3 during 2008, no growth and uh, negative growth, and then technical rebounding, so 0% for two years. Now you just ex should see real growth by, by just 1% or 2%, less than 2%. So it's just the beginning. And, and then if you read very carefully the FOMC statements, the, always the statement remains the same, was, shows that the investments in, in uh, in, in facility and software have grown. That remained all the time. What that means is that although your residential sector or, or housing or residential or consumption generally are not that good, but business sector is not that bad. Uh, so I don't know what not that bad is better or not that good, but, uh, but in any event, one is not that bad, the other is not that good. So. I'm not that much pessimistic. And, uh, and as I said to you uh, earlier, US economy is uh, basically resilient, and uh, labor productivity is, is growing. And so uh, facing uh, double deep recession, I wouldn't say there is zero probability, but very low, very low. So I don't think it is, is uh, as a foreigner, I bet uh, you wouldn't face such a double deep recession uh, soon, or, or in any event. The second one, volatilities, yes. Of course, capital markets are opened, and uh, capital is flowing in and out very frequently. But at the same time, I would say that another difficulty or problem is that the financial real sector linkage is not very high in Korea. Our real sector, represented by big businesses or like uh, the activities by Samsung, Hyundai, reached a certain level. But our financial sector is much lagging behind. And, and, uh, and, and then the size of the sector has not well, is, is small because the market has not well developed, but the markets are open. And so the natural consequence is high, fluct high fluctuation or volatility. It's, it's not quite surprising to find high, high volatility. So this is a question that, or this is a, the problem that we have to, to deal with. And, uh, and I guess we have to ex de develop our bond market or our, our other markets uh, better and more and, and qualitatively we have to make more efforts to, uh, to advance our markets. And so the gaps have, have to be narrowed. And, uh, w w and so th it's not surprising that we find, as I said, high volatility as long as we maintain such a liberalization and market opening policy. This, I think this is a very important uh, issue to be addressed. Unless uh, Korea succeeds in in overcoming or in dealing with such difficulties, then uh, it may not give a good lesson to many, many developing economies who are behind us. They are trying to find a development model. And uh, Korea developed following the so-called market kind of principle, uh, market opening, and liberalization policies. If we don't succeed, and then the countries which are behind us there are, if there are 195 members at the United Nations, so there are about 20 or 30 which are ahead of us, but there are 160, 70 who are behind us. And so we should provide them a model for development. And so to that extent, that is why we strongly argued for establishing global financial safety net and so forth la last year. But uh, still a progress is made, but not yet. But I hope that we uh, find uh, a better result soon. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the, the, what I'd like to do to end on is uh, you're going to have the opportunity to go back to your offices and to your friends and tell them what a, 
what a terrific event that they missed. Uh, <laughs> now, the good news is, uh, very shortly, uh, we'll have the video presentation up on our website. Uh, so if you go to take a look at our new website, you'll be able to, uh, uh, to show your friends and colleagues uh, uh, exactly what they did miss. Uh, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Governor Kim for just a wonderful presentation. Uh, and also to uh, reiterate our thanks to the Korean uh, Economic uh, Society for their support, um, and particularly the KEI staff, uh, who's uh, done a remarkable job of, uh, of bringing and putting all this together. But if you'll join me in thanking Governor Ken for his time and effort, uh, express our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Governor, I know you met uh, Troy Stangerone. He's our senior director. He was in charge of putting.